It is so good to have you in the room and online for week three of our Spirit Lead Me series. A quick recap. In week one, we talked about things that might be getting in the way of the Holy Spirit moving in our lives and that old idea of repentance, the idea of asking ourselves, what do we need to say yes or no to in order to give the Holy Spirit full access to our lives? And then we spent some more time reflecting on that individually and collectively on our first Wednesday night together. And last week, we talked about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fear that can hold us back as individuals and as a community, the fear of looking foolish, the fear of the unknown, fear of losing control. And we finished by talking about choosing power over fear and what it means to say to God like Isaiah here am I, send me or use me. On Wednesday night, we had a full house here uh, for some prac, where we had some practitioners of each gift uh, talk about it and do some Q&A on their area of gifting. And I'm aware that many people missed out on getting to all of the gifts and the conversations that they wanted. But Wednesday night was only really a taster. Uh, It was only a beginning, an opportunity to identify gifts your gifting, uh, to identify gifting in others, and some experienced practitioners to talk to. Good news for those of you who didn't get enough time in the groups, and for those who were actually not able to make it, is you can get more information and feedback on the gifts at the Connect link, and also at sb.org.au forward slash spiritual gifts. So you can also register your gifts online. Um, We would love it for you to do that as we're trying to develop a bit of an inventory of spiritual gifts for SBC to help us utilise our people's gifts for the building up of the church. I've been really encouraged by our Wednesday night. It's been so good to see so many take time to push into our series and open themselves up to the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. There's more to come, and I believe that as we continue to seek God, and open ourselves more to the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, God's going to move in new and surprising ways among us and through us. It's a funny old thing, though, isn't it, that with the Holy Spirit and any other aspect of God, the more you discover, the more you realise there is to discover. Uh, Many years ago, there was a little bump on the paint of a window frame uh, in the side door at our home. And to my horror, as I pressed it, the paint just fell away and it revealed rotten timber beneath it. I peeled the paint back to see how far the rot went. Again, to my horror, it went everywhere. Uh, Not only was the window rotted, but the whole door frame, all the frame around the window was rotted as well. I called a mate of mine uh, to give us a quote on replacing or repairing the door. He said, we can repair it, but it's already been repaired and we will be dealing with the same problem in a couple of years. He also said the frame is a significant structural frame and it needs to be replaced in its entirety for the sake of the whole structure actually staying intact. Good news all round, right? So I asked him to quote it and again, even with mate rates, it was significantly more than we had available in our mortgage redraw. So we actually needed to remortgage our house to get it adequately re-repaired. So I got him to quote an extra bedroom and a dining room and (laughs) while we're at it, right? Um, What started as a little bit of paint bulging on the entire renovation, uh, caused the entire renovation and rebuilding at at the back of our house. Uh, Paul Kelly has a song that describes it well, from little things big things grow. Uh, I reckon sometimes we read the book of Acts like a Christian version of Dr. Zeus, where great principles are lived out, but the actual story feels so outrageous, we treat it like it's fiction. A wild story to make a point. But again and again throughout the book of Acts, God uses some pretty small and ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Indeed, Throughout Scripture, we find it this way. In Scripture, from little things, big things grow. I don't know what you're thinking about 
in, uh, about your part in God's narrative for today. But the chances are you probably think that you're barely making a dent. Some of us can feel pretty insignificant in the scheme of things, particularly if we look at ourselves next to the stars of the show, right? The good news is that what we know from Acts is that God has this habit of really, using really ordinary people to do extraordinary things. In the book of Acts, particularly, from little things, big things grow. And this week, we're looking at the story of two ordinary blokes doing ordinary stuff, and we find them going for a walk down to the temple for afternoon prayers, as was their custom, a daily routine for two fishermen. This daily routine becomes an extraordinary opportunity for God's kingdom to advance. In ordinary people, from little things, big things grow. We probably should pay more attention to little things because more often than not, that's where the kingdom of God seems to break out. I've seen the tiniest sparks of life over the last month or so, just the smallest indicators that God's up to something. Little signs of answered prayers, small steps of faith and tiny little signs of life emerging almost unnoticed. And I'm hoping that it's part of a long obedience in the same direction for us. Even at SBC, I reckon from little things, big things can grow. The question is, how do we posture ourselves for that? How do we best position ourselves for the Holy Spirit to move powerfully among us? So some of you are thinking, how can God use my little prayer? How can he use my little gifts or... I'm not that good a Christian, I'm not that gifted or spiritual for that matter. Well, in today's text, it doesn't seem to be rocket science. What starts as a small thing very quickly becomes something remarkable. And that's what happens when ordinary people open themselves up to God's extraordinary power. Let's do that now. Let's just open ourselves to whatever God would like to do among us today. Let's pray together. Lord, we just ask that as we come here today, lots of us uh, come with uh, thoughts and ideas in our minds about what we can do or what contribution we can make. But Lord, you see it all. And Lord, often when we think about ourselves, we forget that you can do something extraordinary. So God, we open ourselves to that today. We sang it before, but you are welcome here. And we ask that your Holy Spirit might just nudge us in the smallest of ways today. Speak to us where we're at. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm getting some new glasses in a few weeks, and I've got to tell you, I can hardly wait. About 12 months ago, I put my glasses on the bedside table and somehow scratched the right lens. Just Just a little smudgy type scratch, just enough to annoy me. Um... Just a little blurring on the right side there. Not enough to not see, but enough to disrupt my vision. You know what I mean, right? You want to clean it off and can't. The glasses people said there was nothing I could do about it, they could do about it, and eventually my vision would be less disrupted by it. They were right. The eyes have a remarkable capacity to absorb defects. But a couple of months ago, in my rush to go kayaking, I threw my glasses on the front seat of my car and they hit the steel bucket, uh, buckle of my roof rack straps and it hit right in the middle of the left lens, right slap bang in the middle. And I can tell you, big scratch right in the middle of my line of sight and there is no adjusting around that one. I can tell you, I can only see half of you, no not really, it's not that bad. But I can tell you there's no adjusting around, now my vision is disrupted in both lenses. When your lenses get damaged by life. I don't care what the professionals say. I reckon it gets harder to see clearly. And it's not just with glasses. You know, when a person hurts you badly enough, it's difficult to see the good in them clearly. Even if they injured or hurt you by accident, it can still be hard to see through the scars. What about when someone violates trust in a relationship? It's difficult to see them and sometimes even others in the same way again. And so often when we're violated badly enough, it doesn't just impact our 
view of the person who violated us, it impacts our view of others as well. Call it a reality check, call it moving from naivety to growing up, but scars we accumulate through life make it difficult to see others clearly, and dare I say it, others include God. Particularly in relation to healing or God bringing something that we desire. Sometimes our lens gets so damaged by experience that we give up hope that God can or will do anything. So in today's reading, we find these two fishermen, these disciples of Jesus, going down to the temple for their afternoon prayers. And it would have been a normal part of their routine, nothing special about it. And they're looking through a lens, and so is the person they come across. So one day, Peter and John are going up to the temple at the time of prayer, three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. A couple of things to note about the beggar. A, he'd been lame from birth, and it's more than likely he'd been begging for his whole life, and B, it becomes apparent that his lens was one of being crippled and relying on the fickleness of people's generosity. So he's there, he's been put there, and he's, that's the way he views life. The beggar's lens is on display for all to see, including the reader. Uh, when, Peter, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. So the beggar's looking at Peter and John through an income lens. That's how he's viewing them. That's the lens he knows. People's generosity is his means of survival. And we often look at people in all kinds of ways, and many times it depends what day you get us on as to what lens we look through. If we're in a hurry, we might look at them in annoyance. If we're worried about our safety or their power over us, we might look at them in fear, or so on and so forth. The next verse tells us that the lame beggar wasn't the only one looking. Um, Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and Peter said, look at us. So I reckon the beggar thinks this is good news, but not in the way he thinks. Notice that he's still looking through the same lens. It's the only one he knows. He sees himself as a beggar more than a human being in need of healing. And therefore, he sees Peter and John as a source of income. And so the man gave him his attention, and there it is in the text again, expecting to get something from them. It's strange how our view of what we need directly impacts our view of the world around us, doesn't it? I remember when I first went back to church at about 18 years old, after a number of years away, I was looking for a girlfriend at that time, and that's what I thought I needed at the time. I gave God my attention, expecting to get something from him. And indeed, I did receive exactly what I needed, but not what I thought I was looking for. There was, it wasn't a girlfriend that I got when I went to church. It was something very different and far more powerful. Perhaps the first thing we need to note from all of this is that God knows what we need far more than we do. Peter knew that at that time he was attuned to what God wanted and was able to verbalize it. Peter looked and through the Holy Spirit he saw that this man didn't need more money. He needed healing. And I don't know how many times Peter and John had walked past this beggar on their way to daily prayers at the temple. It's highly unlikely that this is the first time. And yet, on this occasion, they stop. On this occasion, they look. On this occasion, they act. Peter says, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. So something powerfully simple about Peter's words here. He basically says, I can't give you what you want, but in the name of Jesus... I can give you what you need. It's interesting, isn't it, how narrow the focus of the lame man is. Over a lifetime of being lame, he's adjusted his expectations of what life may have to offer. 
Some money from a stranger seems to be the best he can hope for. He's pretty clear about what he wants. But Peter is pretty clear about what he needs. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus has a way of cutting through perceptions like nothing else. His vision for life is so much greater than ours. Jesus has power to heal. Jesus has power to change. Jesus has power to strengthen. Jesus has power to protect. Jesus has power to provide. I wonder, do you believe that this morning? Uh, or, or are you looking through a similar lens to the lame man? It's not unreasonable to look through the lens we know, to operate through things that we can control. Many times, I think, we intellectually give assent to the name of Jesus, but actually don't see the power that it has behind it. If you're wondering what I mean by this, just think about your default setting in relation to the challenges that you face in daily life. You have difficulty with your finances. What's the first thing that we do when that happens? We scrabble around for a contingency plan or call on the name of Jesus. Both plans are good, but which one comes first? Friend or family member gets sick. What's the first thing we do? We check the medical options or call on the name of Jesus. Both are good, but which comes first? We have a relational breakdown with a friend or work group or what's the first thing that we do? We enlist some external help or call on the name of Jesus. They're both good plans, but which one comes first? Things go horribly pear-shaped at work. What's the first thing we do? Sit down and come up with a plan to fix it or call on the name of Jesus? Both plans are good, but which comes first? I promise you I'm not paying out. I'm asking myself the question as much as anyone else. As a serial pragmatist, I've got to admit, almost always my plans come first. If I'm to be totally honest with you this morning, calling on the name of Jesus has been the last option for most of my life. Usually it happens after all the other options have been exhausted. Of course, none of you know what I'm talking about. After we've run around trying to fix it desperately, eventually we run up the white flag. Okay, Jesus, over to you, because I've got nothing. You know? I reckon even though calling on the name of Jesus only takes seconds. It seems like most of us seem to like having a crack before we resort to praying. Peter doesn't. His response is to call on the name of Jesus first and let that inform the rest. I've never seen this in the text before, but Peter's response is not without a practical component. But the practical assistance is informed by the name of Jesus, not by the man's request. So if you look at it, Peter says, uh, silver or gold I don't have, but I give you the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Then taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. So the sense of expectancy by Peter is palpable here. He speaks the name of Jesus over the man and tells him to walk, but also simultaneously reaches out and helps him up. And it's an act of expectancy both by Peter and the lame man that God does something spectacular. So he jumped to his feet and he began to walk and he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. There's a Sunday school song about that somewhere, I'm sure. All of you are singing it, even as we speak, I'm sure. I'm not going to sing it for you, but you get the picture, right? So there's something supernatural that's happening here. Uh, Acts and the Gospels are littered with events like this. The name of Jesus, the Spirit of God working together through Peter to bring healing to people. It happens all the time. Now let me be clear here. Peter is a fisherman not a holy man. Peter is a person who knows failure intimately. He's not some kind of bulletproof super apostle. Read the Gospels, it's pretty plainly spelled out. Peter is pretty ordinary by any standard and he knows it. 
The story doesn't end here. Whilst the crowd are all milling to see this remarkable spectacle, and whilst they're staring at wonder in Peter, as you would be, would you not? If you saw this, you would be staring. Uh, Peter names the fact that it's not him who holds the power. He says, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we'd made this man walk? Peter knows it's not his awesomeness or power that pulled this healing off. But the people didn't. This happens again and again through the book of Acts. Uh, People at some point uh, think that Paul's a god. They think that Peter's a god. It happens all the way through the New Testament. The focus swings to the person who facilitates rather than the one who heals. So Peter corrects the people's thinking by directing their focus to Jesus, like you do. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man who you see was made strong. It is Jesus' name. And the faith that comes through him that's completely healed him, as you can all see. So some of you are no doubt thinking right now that this is a Holy Spirit series, so why then focus on Jesus? Let me tell you, because that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit almost always moves our focus to Jesus. You remember Peter on the day of Pentecost filled with the Spirit, turns the focus to Jesus. On this occasion, when the Holy Spirit moves Peter to speak the name of Jesus over a lame man to heal him, but because Jesus, uh, Peter keeps the focus on Jesus, many, many more are impacted, not just the lame man. We often think that the most significant sign that the Holy Spirit is at work is being healed. I want to say it is not the most significant. The most significant sign that the Holy Spirit is at work is that people are committing themselves to Jesus. If you keep reading, the healing isn't the last word in this story. In Acts 4, we're told that because of the preaching of Jesus' name, Peter and John are thrown into jail. But have a look at ultimately what happens as a result of this man being healed. Have a look at it. Many who heard this message were believed, so the number of men, men, not men, women and children, men who believed grew to about 5,000. See, the end game is never about the healing. The end game is about introducing people to the transformative life, death and resurrection of Jesus. The healing of the lame man was temporary. It gave his legs back for the rest of his life. Maybe 20, 30, even 60 years. I've got no idea, but it was temporary. The man dies, as far as I know. So in the grand scheme of things, the effect of his healing that day is actually temporary. Transformation of the thousand or so who responded that day is eternal. When we turn to Jesus, the impact is eternal. When it comes to healing, we need to keep our eyes on the right thing. Do we want the Holy Spirit to move among us and heal people? Yes, absolutely. I have a number of people on that list, people who I would love to see healed. Does God always heal a person when we pray for them? No. And although faith is part of the deal, it needs to be said that no matter how much faith we have, sometimes God does not heal in a way that we would like him to. He is God. He gets to determine the outcomes. I've got a mate of mine who suffered from debilitating anxiety and depression for at least 10 years. And he's had any number of people pray for him in that. He is a godly, faith-filled man and has godly, faith-filled people praying for him repeatedly over the last 10 years. At some point, the invitation from Jesus was very clearly articulated to him in 2 Corinthians 12, where the apostle Paul, I think we can say he's got some faith, pleads with God on three separate occasions to heal him from a physical ailment. A thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan, he calls it. And Jesus answers him, In this way, Jesus says to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. In other words, I'm not going to heal you right now because actually it's much more powerful not to. 
In other words, the main game is not physical healing. The main game is Jesus' presence and power. My friend saw this as Jesus inviting him to befriend his pain and take the opportunity to live in Jesus' power rather than his own. And I can tell you it has been a transformative journey for him. And not only him that's impacted. There have been many others impacted along the way. During this time, God has touched hundreds, maybe even thousands of people through his story and drawn them to Jesus. So sometimes Jesus wants to heal in an obvious way by taking an ailment away. Sometimes he does not. Sometimes he can do even more through illness than healing. The million dollar question is how can we tell the difference? How can we know what to pray when we come across a broken person? A person who needs healing. Well, it's really simple, and it also requires risk. Let me sum it up with two words, and we're going to finish on this today. Listen and respond. Listen and respond to God. This is the gift our prayer team give to our people every week. They follow Peter's example. Peter listened to the man who was asking for money. But more importantly, he listened to what God wanted to do with that request and that man. I think that when people come to us, we look at the situation or ailment they're asking for, and that gets the lion's share of our attention. And often our response is shaped by our listening to them rather than our listening to God. It needs to be said that sometimes even when we do hear from God, we don't really respond to what he's telling us or revealing to us. And if we're to be brutally honest, it's mostly because we don't want to look foolish. I always wonder whether Peter, when he's staring intently back at the man, you know, when the man speaks to him and it says Peter and John looked at him, and in some versions it says they looked at him intently, I always wonder whether he was weighing up whether to make the move or not. Whether he was thinking, God's telling me to speak the name of Jesus over this man and tell a lifetime cripple to hop up and walk. This could end badly. I wonder if, if just while he's looking at him, he's making a decision. So God could have spoken to, to, to Peter. We have free choice, right? And... Peter could have ignored it. We have free choice. And the result would have been temporary and eternal. No healing, no crowds coming to Christ. Listening and responding to, to God does not eliminate risk. We want miraculous healings. We want to see people coming to Christ. But how far are we willing to go out on a limb to see that happen? A number of years ago, I was on a peer supervision <laughs> retreat down at Phillip Island, and four of us were out to dinner at a local pizza restaurant, and we were ordering our pizza, and the waitress serving us had a cast on her hand. And one of the boys, Dave, at that point in time, said to the girl, I see you have a hurt hand. And she said, yeah, and she told him what had happened. Then, to my horror and embarrassment, Dave says to her, listen, all four of us guys are pastors. It would be our pleasure to pray for your hand if you'd like that. She politely declined and I wanted to crawl under the table and we all hammered Dave after she had left us. But you know what? At the end of the day, at least he asked. And we got no idea what was happening behind the scenes for her, what interaction God might have had with her in that question. You need to know Dave to know how absolutely normal that conversation is for him. His wife, his kids, they call it a diving. Uh, you need to know that the vast majority of people that Dave makes that offer to say yes, they do. And interestingly, more often than not, 
they end up saying yes to Jesus as well. He's a freak show. Uh, we, we all reckon that he should make up business cards saying, you've been daved. Um, it, it is remarkable. More often than not, he goes out on the limb and Jesus interacts with the person and crazy things happen. Dave sees more miracles, more wild and crazy stuff happens, more people come to Christ through him than anyone I know. And I reckon most of it hinges around the fact that he has learned to listen and respond. Not only to the situations and the person in front of him, but Jesus in that situation, Jesus in that person. So when we learn to listen and respond to Jesus through the Holy Spirit, it opens the door to new things happening. When we listen and respond to Jesus, people get healed, not only physically, but spiritually as well. Maybe some of you are wondering where you might go to practice that and build some confidence in listening and responding. Well, I'm glad you asked. Up until today, we actually had Christine Wanstall coming on Wednesday night to give us some practical wisdom on listening and responding to God. That was up until today. Now, Christine has been knocked out and we now have Dave coming. So fasten your seatbelts, boys and girls, seriously. Come and get Daved with us. Uh, it, it'll be good. I'm expectant. I think God's at work. I don't know why he's made these arrangements, but he has. More than that, I, I, I just would love for us to become a church that's, that listens and responds to God first, second, and third. That's what we do. Imagine if we were a church who were known for that. A church who said yes, yes to God by listening and responding. Imagine if we were courageous enough to do that in the every day, at home, at work, at play, saying yes to God by listening and responding. At school and with our mates in our workplace, saying yes to God by listening and responding. At the sporting club, on the golf course, in the office and at the gym, saying yes to God by listening and responding. With colleagues, with family, with friends and strangers, saying yes to God by listening and responding. I want to encourage you to come on Wednesday night and do some practice with us. Practice. But right now, I want to pray that God might turn the volume up and give us some courage to actually say yes when he speaks clearly to us. Let's ask for that now. Let's pray together. Lord, many of us want to believe that you can move through us powerfully. But if we're to be honest, we often wonder whether we have what it takes. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, which gives us the ability to listen and the courage to respond. And Lord, we want to say yes to you this morning in our lives, whatever that might mean. Just start at the top. Bring, encourage you to just bring the most important issue you have before him right now and say yes. Yes, Lord, speak to me and I'll listen. Yes, Lord, give me courage and I'll respond. Lord, we thank you that you hear our prayers and that you know our hearts. And we ask in the coming weeks that you might open our ears to your voice and give us the courage to respond in a way that you lead us to. In Jesus' name, amen.